Welcome to this lecture in our course on mechanical operations. In the last class, we started to discuss this topic of um, storage of solids and how it uh, differs from storage of liquids, particularly in terms of pressure transmission characteristics and also shear transmission characteristics. Uh, so this, um, in this lecture, we will look at some actual illustrations of um, solid storage equipment in industry and uh, some of the problems associated with um, storage of solids and how these can be handled. Again, uh, as a refresher, the point is solids are more difficult to handle than liquids or gases. This is something that you will find out, you know, if you get into industry and you have to start handling various types of materials, liquids and gases are much, um, much more conveniently handled than solids. Solids appear in a variety of forms, angular pieces, continuous sheets, fine powders, nanomaterials. So when we talk about bulk solids, it is a collection of solids and they have to be stored in tanks, containers, silos and so on. The storage facilities must be designed such that they do not impact product quality adversely. The behavior of solids, powders, pellets and granules is counterintuitive to the behavior of pure fluids. Again, this is a point that we made in the last lecture that um, you cannot, you know, use your understanding of how liquids behave or gases behave and apply them to <coughs> behavior of solids. Stability over time is important. When you have liquids stored or gases, they are not going to change much over time. Whereas when you are storing solids, they, they do have a kinetic aspect. As we have seen in earlier lectures, everything from cohesion to adhesion to settling to diffusion can happen over time. And so the nature of the stored solid may change appreciably over the storage time. So some of the variations are non-uniformity due to segregation, inconsistency and stability issues. Now the methods of storage are outdoor and indoor. Outdoor storage is referred to as bulk storage and indoor is referred to as bin storage. So bulk storage is typically used for coarse solids such as coal as we talked about last time. They are stored outdoors in big piles. Typically there is no protection from weather and they are used essentially they are shoveled onto a conveyor and delivered to the process. The big advantage of this technique is it is very cost effective. There is hardly any cost associated with storing material outdoor. Bin storage on the other hand is used for more valuable solids that are more sensitive to the outdoor environment or soluble. And as we discussed last time, there are three types of equipment that are used for indoor storage, silos, tall, small in diameter, bins not so tall, wide and hoppers are small vessels, they have a sloping bottom and they are really intended only for very temporary storage. And they are all loaded from the top and discharged preferably from the bottom in order to have the first in first out kind of uh, bins are typically made of steel, concrete, shorter than a silo, uh, used for holding dry matter such as concrete or grain, can be round or square. The round bins or better for from a discharge viewpoint because the um, uh, flow past the, the walls of the bin tend to be a lot more uniform compared to a rectangular bin that has more sharp corners. So this is an example of an industrial <coughs> silo. It actually contains stone, sand and gravel, many varieties. So they are kept segregated from each other. This is obviously a rectangular bin. So, so what are the, some of the features of bin design that are important? Ergonomic. It is important that people who load and unload should not suffer physical strain when they are doing so. Conserve handling time, 
time, space, and energy is also important, particularly in an industrial complex, space is at a premium. So you want to store materials in such a way that you can maximize the quantity of material you're storing, but minimize the space that it occupies. You have to have facilities to store raw materials as well as the unfinished or, or in process bulk solids. And of course, a product as well at the back end of the process. Some of the features, um, you need to have a hinged access so that it's easy to open and close for unloading and unloading, a vacuum receiver, view window, discharge flange, and so on. There is also, many of them are provided with agitators. The agitators are used to make sure that discharge happens in a, in a uniform and smooth fashion. A silo is of course a much taller arrangement. You store bulk materials such as cement, carbon black, wood chips and so on. There are three types of silos, tower, bunker and bag. So in terms of cement storage, which is one of the major applications for silos, there are two types of silos that are used, low level mobile and static upright. The low level mobile or mobile silos where the cement can be moved from one place to the other, easy setup, small capacity, whereas the static upright require less maintenance but can store more material but they are not mobile, they are fixed in place. Bunker silos as the name suggests, you actually cut a trench in the floor and store material in the trench. You know, just like military bunkers. <coughs> These bunkers are then filled using tractors and loaders and packed. So the silos themselves are trenches with concrete walls. You can cover them with a plastic tarp to make, make them airtight, inexpensive, good for very large scale operations. So here the bunker is actually starts below the ground in a trench. It can also extend above the ground. This is a bunker silo to store sugar. A back silo on the other hand actually looks like this. It's, it's essentially just a plastic tube. It's a heavyweight plastic tube, 8 to 12 feet in diameter, variable length. It's custom manufactured, sealed on both ends. Doesn't require much capital investment, temporary measure. So it's just like a plastic bag, you know, that you use to store materials where you seal it. It's the same concept in a much larger scale. And these are called bag silos. There's a 150 foot long, which has been filled and sealed. The tower silo is the one that, for example, we discussed in the last lecture, tall structures, cylindrical typically. They were invented by uh, Franklin King typically 10 to 90 feet diameter, 30 to 275 feet in height. Silage, by the way, is the material that's stored in, in a silo. They're usually unloaded from the top of the pile using mechanical unloaders, but they can also be down, up, unloaded from the bottom. There are two types of tower silos, concrete stave and low oxygen tower. So this is a fairly conventional silo. It's, it's constructed from precast concrete blocks with grooves along each edge and they are locked together. Now one of the big problems that we will talk about later on is that silos tend to collapse quite easily. If pressure on the walls builds up over time or pressure on the base builds up over time, it can actually cause the entire structure to collapse. So you need to provide a fairly high yield strength of, of the structure. And that is done here by using interlocking grooves of, uh, of concrete blocks. So the thing we have to remember is the static pressure of the material inside the silo pressing against the walls will increase as you go towards the bottom of the silo. As we discussed in the last class, the pressure in the direction of application will be greater than the pressure that's normal to it. However, in the case of a silo, this pressure will keep increasing as you go from the top to the bottom, right, because of added material. So the normal pressure which will act on the walls of the silo will also keep increasing uh, as you go towards the bottom, which means that your design of the silo 
must take this into account. You need more reinvo reinforcement towards the bottom of the silo compared to the top and middle. A low oxygen tower silo is one where materials that are stored can decay over time by reacting with uh, oxygen in the atmosphere. So the, you use uh, essentially an impermeable design to prevent seepage of oxygen into the silo. What are some of the problems that we can expect in terms of storage of materials? Well, outdoor storage is always risky. Apart from things like rain, you can also get dust accumulation which, which adds material, which adds impurities to the material that you are storing or leaching which can actually extract material that you are storing. So dust prevention will require some kind of a protective cover to be draped over top of the solid whereas um, leaching can be controlled uh, again by covering the pile or by locating it in a shallow basin. In bin storage on the other hand, environmental protection is not the big issue. The, the major issue here is how do you get good discharge? Charging the bin is something that you can do you know as, as per your requirements of um, transferring the material into the bin but you have to ensure you have to ensure that discharge happens as per your process specifications. Silos, you know one thing you have to remember is when you have, when you are storing finely granulated products, silos uh, are hazardous for a, a different reason, uh, particularly when you are storing finely granulated particles such as grain dust, a single spark can trigger an explosion. In addition to that, even if you avoid explosions, just the, uh, the, the difficulty of, of um, unloading the material is uh, quite severe. Bridging is where you have a silo with an opening and the material instead of discharging smoothly through like this, it actually forms a structure like this and prevents, it is called arching or bridging which prevents the continuous discharge of material through the, the discharge chute. The other type of problem is rat holing and that is where the um, material on the sides never gets discharged. So only the material in the center keeps discharging, the material to the sides keeps accumulating which of course uh, causes this problem of cross contamination with new material and old material. So let us talk a little bit more about silos and silo failures, again some examples of industrial silos and you can see that there are some hints of problem here. You can see that uh, there is a, uh, a, a dimple developing on the outer wall of the silo of course this is the whole thing is toppled over. Right? So when you talk about a silo, you know design is uh, actually quite critical you have to design for the material that you are going to be storing. There is a geometric design but there is also a structural design. Uh, the structural integrity of the silo has to be maintained for various types of storage conditions and you have to look at the time effects also, not just the time zero conditions but also what you expect to happen with time. Failures can happen due to flaws in design, flaws in construction flaws in usage and flaws in maintenance. Again these are what silos are, uh, the types of silos we already saw the tower silos, bunker silos and bag silos. So what are the some of the design considerations? The material, you have to look at what is the material that you are going to be storing. In terms of the geometric design, you know there are two types of flow that can happen. Mass flow is where the entire mass flows through almost in uh, streamlines whereas a funnel flow is what we discussed earlier where the flow starts in the middle and then slowly spreads to cover the entire mass of material. By, by appropriately designing the geometry you can cause mass flow to happen or funnel flow to happen. Structural design is important because 
there are various types of loads that you have to consider on the structure. There is a thermal load, the silo load itself, the initial fill and also what happens once you start flow happening into and out of the silo and you have to calculate all the forces and then make sure that your, your structure can handle these forces. So in terms of the bulk material, what are some of the aspects? The density, uh, the friction that it will have with the wall, whether the material itself can cause abrasion and wear of the materials of construction of the silo, the moisture content in the bulk material, period of storage at rest, the particle size distribution is an important one, the temperature at which you are storing the material and any possible chemical changes that can happen during the storage of the, of the material. So these are considerations from a material viewpoint. In terms of flow problems, as I mentioned earlier, arching is one where the, the material itself forms an arch or a bridge which prevents material on top to discharge through the bottom. Rat holing we talked about, irregular flow where you know flooding can happen essentially fluidization. We are really trying to discharge the particles as particles and if fluidization happens they start behaving like a liquid and you clearly your discharge is not designed to handle liquid flow. So you do not really want fluidization to happen in a, in a silo. And then the residence time distribution, uh, the whole concept of a silo again as I have been mentioning over and over is based on first in first out. You have to make sure that the material that gets into the silo first gets discharged first so that the residence time distribution is very uniform. If that does not happen then particularly in terms of um, products where the um, storage time has a huge implication for the usability of the product for example food products the wide residence time distribution can be a huge problem and finally segregation during storage is always an issue. So what is arching? Again you form this stable arch over the outlet. It, it happens because of cohesion, particularly for fine grained and cohesive solids they tend to form this bridge which is due to attachment or, or adhesion of adjacent particles to form this arch like structure. In the case of coarse particles this can still happen but it is not because of the cohesion mechanism but simply because large particles can just clog the, the entryway to the discharge and thereby prevent other particles from entering. How do you prevent arching? Increase the size of the outlet of course not always the best solution. Rat holing is where stuff sticks to the sides and how do you prevent this? Um, de decrease the period of storage or hammer on the sides as the guy is doing. Segregation um, again happens because you have uh, the large particles accumulating close to the walls of the silo and the smaller particles collecting in the center. It is almost like a centrifugal effect and when that happens once again this can lead to severe quality issues because you do not want you know segregated discharge. You want a discharge which has the same particle size distribution characteristics as the feed material that went in. Okay, I think that is a signal for us to end the class. What I will do, um, I just have take a look at it. I am not going to try and go over this again in class, we just do not have time. But um, if you have any questions. Uh, the next class we will just use the first 5 to 10 minutes for any questions you may have on the material and then it is important for us to discuss how in a, in a silo the pressure gets transmitted as a function of height and also how that affects the discharge of solids through the opening at the bottom. So we will cover that topic in the lecture tomorrow, okay. All right, see you.